Good morrow, Nogatha Fengal here, with just another episode of the Successful Writers Podcast. This week, I'll be explaining how to turn your cardboard cutouts into convincing characters, your story blood clots into fast-moving plots, and your oh dear no no nos into well-crafted prose. But first, a word from our sponsor, Faraday Stoat Repellent. Hello, I'm Nigel Faraday, and my stoat repellent has been the UK's number one stoat repellent for the last eight years. My secret formula ensures that no stoat will come within four yards of you, day or night, or your money back. It even works with weasels. Sometimes, but not badgers. For a limited time, with your first order of Faraday's Stoat Repellent, you'll get a free plushy toy of a goblin. Free plushy goblin toy only available with orders of 40 kilogram bags of Faraday's Stoat Repellent. Terms and conditions apply. Well, welcome back. Hello to another episode of the Failing Writers Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hello, everybody. Oh, yeah. Hello. There's John. Just, um, just reminding people that I'm here too. Yeah, no, it's good. It's nice. Yeah. Nice to see it you. It is nice. We should start off by saying the competition is still ongoing. Our mm. 500 pound, 500 word flash fiction competition sponsored by Scrivener is ongoing. There's still time to get your masterpiece into us yeah i would say assuming that people are listening to this episode on the day it comes out on monday yeah, the 25th of true. september it is not yeah. too late people yeah. you're listening like a year later you it's a bit too kind late. of have missed the boat well having said that tom we have <laughs> we do occasionally get competition entries don't we for our halloween <laughs> competition we still we still had <laughs> a few now and then yeah. people who are, haven't Two quite read ago. the t's and c's properly yeah um yeah so get them in quick it finishes on the 29th of september at nine o'clock in the morning, UK time. So get them in, people. Yeah, get yourself on that shortlist, and you never know. You could win £500. We're going to take two normal wannabe writers. Hi there. Hello. And we're going to give one the normal tools they would use. Notebook, computer, bog-standard word processor. There you go. Oh, thanks. And the other, Scrivener. Ooh. The all-singing, all-dancing, powerful, flexible writing software. And we're going to see who gets writing better, quicker, and more organisedly. Is is that a word? What? Organisedly. Organisedly. Yeah, it is now. So, on your marks. Okay, ready for this? Me too. Get set. You don't stand a chance, mate. Go! So, here we are, three hours later. Let's see how the boys are doing. Well, uh, Dave has written... Uh, well, he's drawn a few doodles. Uh, where is Dave? He's gone to walk the dog and to buy a cheese and potato pasty. Right, uh, so... nothing. And John, with the power of Scrivener, let's check in on him. John, how's it going? Oh, hey, Tommy. Yeah, yeah, going really well. Yeah, 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 great. Oh, so Scrivener has helped you organise your thoughts, make notes, attach research where you need it, giving you the tools to plan and structure your work in as much or as little depth as you like. <laughs> and you are just spurting out words onto the page. Mm-hmm. E yeah. <laughs> well, let, let's, let's have a look, then. At uh, what? Why? Have you, have you done anything? Yeah, I've... I've uh, right, well, that's literally ruined this advert for Scrivener, hasn't it? Mm, sorry, Tommy. I mean, it still does all that amazing stuff that's going to make writing whatever you're writing easier. A novel, story, non-fiction book, research papers, anything. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. I love it. Total convert. It just doesn't write it for you. You still have to actually put the work in at your end, John. Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, that is true. All right, lads. what I miss? Here, have you told them that you can get a 30-day free trial of Scrivener at literatureandlatte.com? Not yet, no. Well, you should. And that they can get 20% off by using the code FAILING. Right, let's have a No, anyone want a pasty? No, we don't want a pasty. Well, uh, have, you got one, have you got one spare? Tom, I'm going to ask you the big question. Mm -hmm. What have you been writing this week? Uh, I have been writing more of my kids' book. Have you now? Yeah. Because yeah. when I last spoke to you, we had a little chat, didn't we, at the start of the week, and you said you hadn't done a lot. So does that mean you pick things up, you pick the pace up towards the end of the week? Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I mean, I'm not done masses, but it's uh, it's going along, yeah. 
Uh, I think we're on well done, mate. getting towards 19,000 words now. So. Oh, wow. Okay, so it has jumped. Yeah. You're nearly there, Tom. You're nearly there. Steady amount, steady amount. And it's going along quite nicely. Just hit another little, you know, I, I think I was talking last time about hitting a point where, mm. where you have to logic things out and it has to yeah. make some sense. A little speed bump. Yeah, so just uh, another one of those today. But um, again, scribbling furiously on a notepad seems to... Uh, <laughs> That's your way through, isn't it? It does. It seems to be the case. Quite like it, yeah. I might try that. That has been avoided. I need a, I need a strap for that It's almost well. just like getting bullet points down. If this happens and this happens and this happens yeah. and this happens and this happens. I'm a little bit of a screen starer. <laughs> right. I don't think that's uh, very useful. No, I've I've been very purposefully taking myself away from my mm. writing area and screen mm. and just going to have a little sit in the kitchen, have a coffee or something, take the notepad with me, just change of scenery just to be mm, in. That's good. But yeah, that seems to have worked. What about you, John? What have you been writing? Well, um, we, I think... I think I promised, didn't I, that I would write at least 2,000 words. Yeah, I mean, I've I've learnt to count your writing promises as... <laughs> Fluid. Promises in the loosest yeah. sense of the word, yeah. Um, well, I um, I have some news, and I thought, um, yeah. as we're chatting with Ollie Moll in just a few minutes, yeah. I'm going to tell you in the style of autofiction. How do you feel about that? Uh, can I tell you after you've done it? <laughs> you can if you want, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that. It's very much the same reaction I usually get when I tell you I've had a brilliant idea, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Go on. No. Go on then. Yeah. Okay. So imagine Tom, my yeah. excitement on discovering a causal link between my appetite for breakfast and my appetite for writing. Mm. Okay. So a couple of mornings ago, I didn't get a chance to have breakfast, so I snarfed a coffee, and then I walked the dogs, and by the time I got home, I was itching to get writing, itching like a junkie. And so I emptied 2,500 words from my brain through my fingers and onto the screen of my laptop, very much like a pump at a petrol station. Aha, thought I. Clearly the energy required to digest my breakfast has for once been transferred to my writing. From henceforth, unfailing productivity in the morning will be achieved via the simple task of not eating anything. Finally, I have a means to grind out the time and motivation to write. It was breakfast all along. Or rather, breakfast has been the thing holding me back all these years. If only I'd known, if only someone had told me. So the following morning, I got up, made a coffee, and very consciously avoiding making a piece of crisp toast and slathering it with a, a thick, claggy layer of crunchy peanut butter and topping it with some thinly sliced sweet banana. I made my way to my desk and I opened my laptop. But lo, as I began to write, all I could see was that slice of toast drifting before my eyes, like Macbeth's dagger, peanut butter on toast of the mind, marshalling me, marshalling me the way to the bread bin. And that's it. That's my little autofiction story, the essence of which is true. Lovely. So that's that was my little experience. So is it the thought of breakfast, do you think, that prevents you from writing? No, I, just, I don't think that breakfast has anything to do with it whatsoever. Oh, right. Okay. I just think that I had that moment. I didn't know whether it meant that if you didn't have breakfast and you weren't <laughs> thinking about having breakfast, then you could write. Well, I think that's probably true. Maybe that's true. Yeah. But I don't think it makes any I think any... marketing-wise, there's a gap either for a book that's about dieting and writing <laughs> in one fell swoop, yeah. corner two kind of large markets yeah, there, yeah. I think, couldn't you? Who was it we spoke to? Oh, it was, uh, it was Gillian, wasn't it? It was Gillian McAllister. Gillian McAllister, yeah. Who wouldn't let herself yeah. eat until yeah, she... Well, yeah, so maybe there is something yeah, in it. Maybe. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, the essence of that story is true. The two 2,500 words of my murder mystery have been written. Yeah. So that's... That's good, isn't it? Yeah, and wasting time writing 300 words of auto-fiction to explain it. <laughs> you can count that as well, can you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's Prolific. part of the word count. Prolific. It's not, actually. It's not. But yeah, I was, uh, I was quite pleased. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? That really, it's just about doing it. Well, that's what people have been telling us for a long time, isn't it? Yeah. Get your ass on the chair yeah. and press the keys. But... In terms of, we were talking about speed bumps before, I've just got over, I think, the last speed bump. You know, I said that I hadn't plotted out the last bit. Yes. Well, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I know everything that happens pretty much, as in, you know, not down to the finest detail. But I, So now you're going, for, you know, where you're going from point to I'm point. Doing. You know what the points are. Yeah. I've got probably 12,000 words and I'm done, first draft. Wow. So it's close now. And I feel like Brilliant. 
I feel like it's speeding up almost towards the end. It's like I'm nearly there. I could just sprint this bit. Brilliant. Mm. Well, look at us. Yeah. yeah. I know. Look at us writing. Yeah. <laughs> Who yeah. does thunk it? Lovely. So, Tommy. Yeah. Who have we got? Oh, yeah, Ollie. Oliver Moll. Ollie Moll. This is interesting, this interview, mm. I assume, because mm. it probably was. <laughs> but we did do it a long time ago. It was a really long time. Can you remember the actual month we interviewed Ollie? Was it like January or something? I think it could have been, maybe even before. I do remember it being interesting and different. Yeah, definitely. Very much like his book, to be honest. You know, when you, you're talking to somebody like in a pub or you, you're talking to somebody and they start oversharing a little bit. Mm. It was a little bit like that, wasn't it? But in a good way. So the story behind his book, reading from the inside of his uh, dust jacket here, Ollie had a 10-month migraine, which just doesn't even, can't even consider that. Difficult to comprehend that, isn't it? So he was a writer and he'd had some success at quite a young age, really. Then he had this migraine and basically he couldn't do anything. He couldn't write or read or basically do really anything involving a screen so he googled full-time job no experience sydney and an advert for a train guard appeared so that's what he went and did so this book starts out with him at that time and sort of follows him and he shares all his innermost thoughts really doesn't he he does and what's also fascinating about it and i i haven't read loads of autofiction but i think it's a really interesting concept autofiction because it's neither fiction nor autobiography it's some, somewhere kind of in the middle isn't it yeah so you're never entirely sure what's completely true or what you know he's kind of embellished yeah but the essence of what he's telling you is the truth i think that's kind of the idea isn't it and i can't remember whether we asked him this or not uh but it must be really <laughs> hard and interesting to edit something like that because because it is just kind of flowing out of your head mm stuff isn't it mm. it must be really difficult to decide what you're going to get rid of mm. to say right well that bit's nonsense because it's like well actually some of the fact it's kind of wandering nonsense builds it all, all adds something it must be really hard to mm. take away what, what to know what to keep and get rid of mm. i think we do talk about that don't we talk about do we yeah i think good in terms good. of uh yeah how much of the truth to use and how much yeah. just you know whatever yeah. comes out of your head yeah but it's a good one so have a listen. Welcome to the Failing Writers Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having that me. Is, that is the correct response. Thank <laughs> you very much. Continue reading the script. Um, so you're actually, um, as your Antipodean accent will give away, you are an Australian, aren't you? But you're not in Australia right now. You're in Paris. I am in Paris. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm Australian. Um, but I left uh, roughly a year ago. So um, I was fortunate enough to get an Australian um, council grant and I moved to Tbilisi, Georgia. Oh, okay. And um, yeah, spent the last year there um, sort of writing and researching what I hope to be my next book. Um, but yeah, we've just moved to Paris. So now, now we're in Paris. Is this because of another book? Is this also research or is this just because you've got a bit of Paris? Is this pure yeah, gallivanting? It was a, it, it was, it's a bit of both. The, the Georgia stint was, you know, a lot of, uh, I mean, basically I was really in, like, I, I will probably get into this later, but when I wrote Train Lord, um, I ended up in Georgia. Um, because I'd moved to Spain with this really romantic idea that I was going to uh, take my life savings and, and and write my book there. And then I, um, I mucked up my visa. So oh. I ended up moving to Albania. Uh, I had to be outside of the EU. Um, and I lived in Tirana for a while and then ended up spending three weeks um, living in a tent on the beach, sort of right <laughs> wow. from there. So, yeah, and then and then I ended up in Georgia for six months before COVID. So and currently the only countries there. you've not lived in are Japan and Mexico, is that correct? <laughs> claro que sí, wow. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you just naturally a bit of a traveller then? Do you not like to set down routes? You're always looking for well, somewhere else. To... I mean, we, we grew up, I grew up in America and I've been thinking about this a little bit. Actually, a friend in Georgia, um, we went up to Tusheti. He's a, he's a writer. He's, he's about 75 um, and he's sort of written like the definitive right. hiking guide on Georgia. He's a really interesting guy named Peter Naismith. And, um, and he asked me, he's like, Oliver, where, where would you say your home is? 
and it really threw me because <laughs> you know he's like he's like me i can say my home is in london it's a probably terrible london actor no it is and, that. It's um, a really terrible london yeah it's a really terrible. interesting question because i think if i'm really honest I've, I've sort of been searching for a a place to put down roots a, a place to to stay for a while um and i mm. and i sort of thought that was georgia and potentially it might be in the future but yeah, for now we're in Paris because um yeah my girlfriend's work works a lot here so she moved to Georgia for me seemed fair to oh yeah what a, what a hardship yeah yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> good on you mate yeah well done all the well baguettes done. yeah so the book yeah. you were writing in Georgia is that like a fiction book or is that is that more sort of auto fiction yeah it it will be a yeah a, a fiction book um so. I'm still very much working it out, but essentially when I, when I lived there for six months in um, 2019, what I was really struck by and what I was really interested in is this, it felt very much like there was a push and pull between um, East and West. And especially, you know, if, if you're, if you're 35 and under, you'll speak English and Georgian. And if you're 35 and older, then you'll speak <laughs> Russian and Georgian. And um, and I said, I don't know what what I kind of found like was, um, you know, you you go and this is probably grossly unfair, but you go to places like Sydney or perhaps New York or Paris or London or Yorkshire or you know wherever have you, and um, and as, if you were to shake a snow globe, all the sediments would kind of uh, settle, right? Mm -hmm. You can kind of see an outline of an area. You can kind of make sense of a place whereas in Tbilisi in Georgia I kind of I shook that uh, metaphorical snow globe and it was and I, and I couldn't see through it like I really couldn't see and I think a lot of that has to do with the uh, the Christian Orthodox Church which is uh, really really strong in Georgia um, and then the youth who uh, you know everything but that the youth are super um, liberal and um you know that uh, are fighting for for queer rights mm. and and for um you know uh, dancing is literally a form of protest there um <laughs> wow. you know in 2018 the police came into one of their biggest nightclubs called bassiani um which is in an abandoned pool beneath a sports stadium very cool <laughs> and uh <laughs> and uh they ended up arresting um a bunch of people and came in, in full right gear and people uh, lost their eyes and and a bunch Jesus. of people were arrested and, and people were injured and and essentially what happened was the following day for the next two weeks twenty thousand people raved outside of parliament <laughs> essentially like they came in on the pretense that there were drugs being sold but in reality it was a safe space for queer people mm -hmm. um and so you really feel this uh this electric um changing and happening and i suppose in whatever this next book is, uh, I wanted to uh, come in and try and make sense of that. So. Wow. Sounds fascinating. I mentioned um, autofiction before uh, because mm. obviously you are kind of known as an exponent of that. Would you call it a genre? Is it a genre? Autofiction, I suppose. Yeah. Is it a classification or a genre? I think it's a genre, isn't it? Yeah, I reckon. Yeah. What? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, maybe start by explaining to us what that is. And maybe talk about why why you were drawn to it as a genre. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose autofiction would be, uh, um, you know, a fiction of writing in which the writer uses the story of their own life, but perhaps isn't weighed down by the spe specificity <laughs> right? specificity good. <laughs> um, of the a to b of perhaps like a person's life mm. so much like in fiction um events can be rearranged you know I, I guess when you when you look at it more broadly well it's almost really hard to say that anything is strictly non-fiction i suppose because memory is fallible yeah at the best of times and and when and you know when you're recording when you're tr i i, I kind of look at it like translating like you're trying to translate through mm. the filter of memory and you know depending on your situation at the time um how long has elapsed and mm -hmm. perhaps whose interest you're trying to protect that that's all going to be grossly yeah, yeah. so i mean even in even in the process of perceiving something you're kind of shaping it to a certain extent as well yeah well, i said every time you remember something you're remaking the yeah. memory in your head it's, it's not you're not remembering it you're not remembering the original mm. memory. Yeah, absolutely. You're remembering your re-remembering re of your memory. I don't think I'll make it any clearer than that. 
it's complicated out there. And, you know, for me, when I, you know, a lot of, a lot of the book train Lord that I wrote, like I was on a pretty intense amount of, not when I wrote it, but when I was uh, living it, I was on a pretty intense amount of painkillers. Mm. So it bloody feels like it in places, Ollie, I'll tell oh, you. Oh, thanks, mate. <laughs> you can, it, it, it does come through. Some of it was uh, dizzying in, in a, in a good way. Do you mean like really, really engaging? It's funny what you're saying about one of my favorite quotes, if not my favorite quote out of that book, which I'm going to read now that's all right oh, please. is about stories and and the remembering and where they come from mm. so ollie you 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 write this is what you wrote <laughs> but we can never quit stories not really not while we're alive we can only see them for what they are flashes of light and pain and laughter that travel at breakneck speed from our bodies to our heads that color all the fucked up and beautiful things that have ever happened ultimately stories are not for truth they are for magic and alchemy and waking in the middle of the night and second guessing. They are for editing and rearranging and talking back. They are bridges to the places that no longer or never existed. And the only reason I'm still writing is because I believe, however childlike, that there might be something on the other side. And then you go on to tell a story from the other side. Mm. That's, part of, that's, that's the start of one of your chapters. Thank you. That was... But yeah, it's lovely to hear back. Um, but I just think that that kind of captures that sort of idea of which a lot of a lot of train law does is kind of take real stories and real memories and sort of remold them and repackage them almost from a, a, a different viewpoint. I think sometimes I suppose when I, when I was trying to um, should I tell should I should I, tell, should I just give a brief idea about what the book is sort yeah, of yeah please about. do that's a good time to do it um, yeah. so yeah the, the book essentially. Um, it uh, focuses on the experience of a 10 month migraine that I suffered shortly after my first book came out. And then um, after I nearly took my life, um, basically no doctors could help me. Um, the pain was extreme. Um, it wasn't that I wanted to die. I just, uh, and I write this, I just needed the pain to end luckily. And what I put down to divine um, intervention or coincidence um, that didn't happen. And I returned to Brisbane to be with my family. And then a short time later, three months later, um, after I'd not exactly gotten on top of the migraines, I I'd seen a guy that I refer to as the healer who had mm -hmm. manipulated, he wasn't a real doctor, <laughs> but he, he had manipulated all the um, uh, muscles and nerves in my neck. And um, what that meant was it was sort of a Band-Aid solution to, um, I suppose, hacking my body. So as long as I didn't look at screens, which I should have mentioned, the, the migraines um, mainly came in, in, in um, intense severity from um, iPhone screens mm. and computers and books and then yeah. lights and then basically anything up close. As long as I didn't do any of that, I was okay. As long as I did all my manipulations and... And then where the story really picks up is that I, I returned to Sydney because I needed a job. So I, one day I took two painkillers and I just Googled no experience full-time Sydney. And this job on the railway came up as a train guard. And, um, you know, I, I didn't think I had much hope of getting it, but um, it was a job that didn't involve all the things more or less that I mentioned. And um, I speed typed an application and sent it in. And then um, after five rounds of interviews and, you know, a, a sort of simulation and drug tests and um, role plays, um, about five months later, um, I think 40,000 people applied, but I was somehow offered the job. And, um, you know, in hindsight, and I remember telling my friend Nadia, it sounds almost... Um, like the metaphor is beautiful, right? I think I told her, I was like, oh, well, the book will write itself now. But but it, this job I really came to out mm. of necessity. It was by no means a writing venture. I'd largely given up on writing at the time. But like I said, you know, of course, in hindsight, the metaphor was beautiful, right? You're going around mm. and around on a track, on a pre-existing loop uh, around, around the city that your trauma's in, trying to um, make sense of it and trying to understand it. And um, to, to get back to our earlier point around, you know, auto fiction or um, what stories are for, um, for me, and like I said, I, I was quite medicated a lot of the time, um, you know, pre-railway pre when, I, when I was having this 10-month migraine. And the way I looked at it when I finally sat down to try and write it was essentially 
And I think a lot of people who experience their own traumas in various ways can understand this. Like no one's ever going to be able to understand your pain ever. Mm. Your, your experiences are your experiences. And, but I knew potentially with writing, I knew I could maybe get people close. And so I suppose I, I kind of viewed the migraine as this central figure, much like a sun. And then in the same way that planets orbit the sun, I started viewing these various chapters that I might write sort of reflecting back to that experience. Mm. But I also imagined that those planets might be sort of wrapped in a, like a shattered glass. And so the reflections would kind of be bouncing all over the places, but in a composite, mm. once you'd read the book, which does jump around in time, my hope was that rather than you being a reader that is, you know, on the other side of a football field and not really being close to the story, I wanted to bring you right over my shoulder and mm. I wanted to make you feel as much as I could sort of what I felt. I wanted to take you through that experience. I think it's very successful in doing that. I was going to ask you to read a little bit, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite bits of the book um, is the chapter Hope. And just to, just to give our listeners a bit of a preamble, in this chapter, you tell the story of when you were eight and you fell in love with Melanie who lived down the street. And you talk about her bravery. You talk about a day when she came into school wearing makeup. And at break time, while you're planning to ask her to a school dance, you overhear her friends talking about her in a very unkind way, about how ridiculous and, and slutty she looks wearing makeup. Mm. And you write about, well, you, you, you basically write about being too terrified to confront them mm. about what arseholes are being. Mm. Um, and that afternoon, you go around to Melanie's house to make sure she's okay, and her dad answers the door. But then her dad starts crying, and you go upstairs to see Melanie, and she tells you that her mom died of cancer. Mm. And then soon after, they leave town, and you never see them again. Obviously, you tell the story a lot better than that. <laughs> but, uh, oh, cool. but I was wondering if you would read us the next section, because I think it sort of gets, it gets to the heart of what the book is doing, I think, and maybe even maybe why you had to write it in the first place yeah, in a way. it seems to tie a lot of threads together in relation to truth and fiction and confession and pain uh yeah page 139 yep. if you've got it there thanks ollie when are you going to stop writing sad stories my dad asked me earlier that day when we were walking around rome i liked your old stories the ones you wrote when you were just starting out the one about the boy who dressed in a tiger suit and ran around the city saving lives. We were standing out front of the Colosseum and I shrugged, shielding the sun from my eyes. I don't know, I said. I guess when I've said all I have to say. But what I wanted to do, what I should have done, was told Dad to read the story again. Come on, I wanted to say. You knew Melanie. You knew her mum. She didn't die. You were there. Cowardice, I wanted to say to my dad then, now. It was a story about cowardice. Fiction, absolutely. But more or less true. Sure, I'd say. Melanie wore makeup to school and she kissed my cheek once. But her mum never died of cancer. That happened to another friend's mum in high school. And all that stuff about hiding behind a tree, about listening to Melanie's friends talk shit behind her back, about being weak, selfish, invention too. But the themes I'd say smiling, though trying not to. That same smile I'd smiled in the story when everything felt so real. The themes. And then maybe I would have told him about that day, that sunny afternoon at the end of 2015, when I walked to Central Station and nearly jumped in front of a train. How it was a day like any other. High school kids laughing, flirting, old men reading newspapers, mothers pushing prams, businessmen staring at phones. Just a step, I told myself, just one. I did not want to die. I just wanted the pain to go away. Cowardice. But perhaps if I had been better at communicating, I would have tried to explain my limited understanding of storytelling. That in fiction, it's not only possible, but mandatory to invent. That we create cause and effect. That when a story is told convincingly, even those boring, sad ones, 
We transport the reader to another world where fathers and sons understand what the other is trying to say. Of course, life or the so-called real world is more cruel. Sometimes people fall in love and never see each other again. Other times, relatively unknown, mediocre writers suffer migraines that don't go away and they imagine killing themselves. Occasionally, they almost try. Here's the truth. There was a girl named Melanie who lived at the bottom of my street. We were eight years old and we were in love. One afternoon, while watching Strictly Ballroom, she kissed me on the cheek. And then there was a for sale sign in her yard and I never saw her again. No cause or a cause I didn't understand. Huge effect. I remember the day she left. I walked around the house, the street. My heart felt hot, something searing, like there was a hole in it. I walked to the park. I sat on the slide and went down the slide, and I sat on the bark. I stared at the trees. Someone had spray-painted X's on the trees, and I knew what they meant. I knew Dad was right, and I knew the world was bullshit, because these weren't the X's you find at the end of a love letter. These weren't the X's that told you there was buried treasure somewhere. These were the X's that meant everything goes away. A sad memory, sure, but the fact that I can write it now makes it a happy story too. Perhaps it's best to end like this. When you tell someone about a migraine, they usually shake their head and laugh. They tell you they know all about them. They used to get one occasionally, or their mum or dad did, and they know how awful they are. Sometimes they mention how they nursed a loved one through an episode or two. They tell you how they watched them suffer, how they couldn't get out of bed. You can't just take a Panadol for one. They know that, that all you can do is wait a couple of hours, a day at most. And you nod, thinking about the waiting. And they smile and you return it because more or less, the pain has been understood. But just once, you want to shake them. You want to smack them in their stupid face. You want to say the pain was nothing like that. Ten months, you want to say. Ten. As if stating a fact could make people understand. But it doesn't. And you don't. And instead, you keep smiling. And you try again with another metaphor. With a story. Very good. Thanks for that, Oliver. Yeah, thanks, Oliver. I was just thinking like yeah when i was when i was right like I, I remember sort of it's really funny right because so essentially for the readers what happens in this in this chapter is that there's the initial story where i say something happened with melanie um this will be better if i could remember and then we go to the dance and then all i all i remember about this bit, Ollie, is reading it um it being quite emotional and then realizing that you were basically just making up stories and me saying out loud Oh, you fucker. <laughs> yeah. well, As I a, felt like risk. I'd been reeled in like a naive little fish. It's a, <laughs> I, I remember what I wanted to say. So what I want to say first is that this, this first story, the first one I wrote about how I invite Melanie to the school dance and then mm. I'm talking to Dean and, and uh, basically I get um, really embarrassed and feel like I don't exist in front of one of his friends. And then I ask my mm. mother why people behave the way they do. Um, and, and it's a real, it's a real story about being young and you think the world is one way and the world's another. Right. Mm. And then, and then I say, oh, well, that didn't happen. Mm. And, then, and then I go back and I tell this other story about Melanie and, and her wearing makeup to school. And then me not having the courage to, um, you know, to, to confront the, um, the people who were, um, tormenting her. And then at the end, I go to her house and her mother's died and she's crying there. And she says she didn't wear makeup for me. She doesn't care about any of that. She wore it because she wanted to keep her mother alive. It's her mother's mm. makeup. And, and what I find really interesting about this story, and, and I think it's about true about the power of storytelling. And, and, and essentially, that first story I wrote, I remember I tried to write it um, shortly after I'd seen The Healer when I returned to Brisbane. And I knew there was something I wanted to tell about this character, Melanie, who um, I, I did go to school with when I was young. And we were, you know, more or less boyfriend and girlfriend, mm -hmm. and I did love her. Um, but I couldn't figure out why or what that was. And I must have spent, you know, a month or two just compulsively pressing my neck and then staring at a screen and trying to learn how to tell stories again. But I felt compelled <laughs> to try. And then I put it away for about seven years. 
or whatever whatever that time period was of five years or something and then i started i tried to rewrite this story and i rewrote this the other story about melanie and the makeup and i and i, and I managed to finish that and i thought well that's an interesting story but i don't i'm not too sure if it goes anywhere or what it means or if it has any significance and then i was writing the, the sort of final part of the i was i think i was running one day and i was trying to think it's essentially what i said to you before i was like how how do i get people to feel what i felt and mm. and and and, and this these three stories much like planets sort of lining up in a you know solar eclipse or whatever i don't know if that's the right reference <laughs> but i'm going to keep talking it was like it was like these stories these ideas had had come to me at, at a certain point and said you need these ideas to be expressed but the time which you know they're going to be where they're going to find their their other ideas to surround them to make sense you have to be patient you have to hold your nerve which is something um, my mentor says you have to hold your nerve and you know coming back to i knew it was a i knew it was a huge risk right to 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 lie to the to the reader but mm. i thought if that anger could then be transferred into understanding if that anger at being lied to at at the world not being the world that you thought it was mm. then beyond the mm. emotions of the story even that meta idea of of being lied to was a lot like my experience with the migraine mm. and and i guess i knew it would anger some people and i knew i might lose some people but i thought if people really sat with it and questioned why the author might do it then potentially it was kind of like betting all on black mm. and there was there was a chance that it might pay off so and this almost it's almost like there's more for me it felt like there was almost more honesty in the lie yeah ultimately and and i suppose sense. you know that idea again between i knew that i had to use um fiction and non-fiction and sadness and humor um and and uh you know reportage and and old letters and and anything at, at mm. my disposal i think to you know to in, in my planet metaphor to, to kind of refract back to the essential experience and um mm. to who am i thinking of um hannah gadsby you know she says this genius thing and it's true about storytelling as much as it is about jokes but she says that you know every story is about or every joke sorry is about creating tension and releasing it creating tension and releasing it and mm, yeah, yeah yeah and for me you know as a storyteller i knew i had you know it's it's not an easy sell to i mean i lived through it and it was bloody awful <laughs> like to try and get people to to hey you want to know my pain story like you got to dress it up and you, you gotta you gotta make people laugh yeah, yeah. and I think the writer Scott McClanahan, who's from America, mm. you know, he he kind of talks in this accent from West Virginia, and he's probably the greatest writer under forty in like the whole world, in my opinion. But he he basically said this thing. He's like, you know, man, like a lot of these writers that are trying to write these pain stories, they they don't they just stick with the straight story. But if you the world's a funny place, man, it's a fucked up funny place, and if you just put a bit of that humor in there. Then you're going to be able to go to some of the darkest places you've ever been because people are going to go on that ride with you, right? And it's kind of true. Yeah. Anyway, I've gone off on a huge tangent. There, no, it's um, it's good. It, it, reading your book got me thinking more about what literature is actually for. Like, what what do we what do we go to books for? Because I think um, I think people used to go to books often as it was just a, another form of entertainment. But these days, you, you know, you've got so much good TV. You've got more good TV than you could ever possibly watch. And, you know, there's TikTok and YouTube. There's so much kind of entertainment. There's so much content. You've got computer games. And, you know, you, and you sort of wonder, you wonder if that has potentially pushed literature into slightly more interesting places, like kind of these liminal places mm. um, that you're talking about. And maybe whether the idea of reading for entertainment purely is a bit less relevant than it used to be yeah it makes me think it makes me think a bit like um a bit like theater when film came along theater basically had to reinvent itself it had to you know and it, it did actually become more interesting because of it maybe a bit more challenging but more interesting and it feels like for me the internet might be having a similar impact on literature you know reading reading books like yours and uh ben lerner and i don't know just there's that kind of 
you, you know, looking into difficult places, I guess, is what I'm talking about. I just appreciate it being mentioned in the same sentence as Ben Lerner, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> that, I read his uh, 1004 recently, yeah, it's and it's got a similar sort of quality. Are you, are you a fan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, reading him. He's, um, he's very good. Yeah, but I haven't read his latest book, but um, yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a genius. He's one of those writers that you kind of like, you read the book several times and he's still don't really know how he's pulled off the magic yeah. trick of what he's done. And it's also, you know, they're very funny as well. Oh, they're, and, so, yeah. uh, they're fantastic. But yeah. What I was going to say on, on kind of like the book is, and I, th- I think I heard this in like a Rick Rubin podcast recently, but with the book, right, we're, we're still doing all of the work in our heads. So the way that you come to the page and your friend comes to the page and I come to the page with the same story like we're all looking at it through that lens of our own mm. our own head and and apparently you know when there when there are verbs like well, we, I don't mean to define <laughs> but doing we all know what verbs but doing words <laughs> yes that makes sense now yeah. <laughs> now do nouns and, and pronouns no longer the failing writers <laughs> <laughs> but apparently like when you read you know I went, she left, I ran, they they flew, whatever. You in your head, you're doing the same things as you're reading. You're 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 mm. mentally you're mentally in that space in that storytelling mm. world. Whereas when you watch something on the screen, it's all just being sort of shoveled at you. And and I think because of that, there's still there's probably some books that would never this and I guess that's why you know with, with books that hit really hard emotionally and then you see the film and they often don't compare and I think mm. it's I think it's for those reasons right mm. you just want to be there with with a beautiful story and your thoughts and and it is quite childlike you know so <laughs> how are you are you all right good good what's that yeah yeah I've been okay actually um busy you know with stuff Oh, I'll tell you one thing I did this week. I managed to get the washing machine fixed. Ah, turns out it was just a coin uh, stuck in the filter. Yeah, so that was good. Yeah. <gasps> I've remembered. <laughs> I've remembered why I'm here. This is the Failing Writers Podcast. Of course, silly. I've, I've got a confrontational question for you. Where where do you draw the line in terms of what you see as fair game to use from your life, from other people's lives around you and publishing a book? Mm. Do you have like a, a cutoff point? Do you have a code of ethics, Ollie? Yeah, do I have morality? <laughs> do you have morality? morality? Do you have any limits? Do you have any <laughs> respect for your fellow human beings? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question because, and again, it's something that I talk about in my book, you know, what happens to you if you were to draw sort of a circle around it and see that who that interacted with? It's interesting to see where your stories overlaps with others. And then on that, what stories you're allowed to tell. Mm. And, you know, there is a lot of talk these days around the stories that people are allowed to tell. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I had an, I have another analogy about what it kind of felt like writing it. And as long as I was serving this analogy, I was happy to put whatever I needed to into it. And essentially, I felt like even though I had lived and survived this 10 month migraine and, you know, the sort of ongoing years of chronic pain, but for the most part, that 10 month migraine, I knew that when I sat down and I was going to write this book, that I would be creating a world in which a version of me, a character like me, but not exactly me, because it's obviously within a book. Um, I'd be taking this character through this sort of maze, through this labyrinth. And I knew that once I'd started, I knew if I stopped, then this version of me, who this younger version of me, this storytelling version of me, who is still a part of me, would be trapped in that world forever. And I, and I knew I couldn't abandon him. And so everything that I wanted to tell in this book every trick that I knew how to use, even if it involved other people's stories or um, involved, again, sort of manipulating my own stories. These were all tools to continue building his world so that I could pull him through and get him out alive. Mm. And I think basically, I mean, my parents read it as I was, not as I was writing it, but during lockdown when I was writing a lot of it, I read them some pretty uncomfortable scenes that um, actually... (laughs) (laughs) 
it was actually quite emotional and yeah, it was bet. quite good for us, especially my father. Mm. And I think on, on a positive, I would say, um, in terms of, um, yeah, what, what stories you're allowed to tell, I think you can, as long as you're not throwing anyone under the bus more than you're throwing yourself yeah. under the bus. Right, yeah. You've kind of got more responsibility in a way, haven't you, with autofiction because in a way you're, you're kind of God. You can, you can sort of change things however you want to. You've got more responsibility to, to do the right thing. Yes, it would be easy. It would be I mean. easier, easy to be quite naughty yeah. with it, wouldn't it? Yeah. I'm going to use that bit, but that didn't quite go how I wanted. <laughs> so I'm going to turn them into a terrible shit. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. But I think, like, if you, were, if you were to do that, you'd notice very quickly that you were, you were writing a very poor and disingenuous book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'd probably be out of spot that, wouldn't you? Yeah. As a reader. Yeah. And, and, and that's kind of talking from the point of view of exposing other people or using their stories how how does it sit with you in terms of the limits of exposing itself because a lot of it felt very very raw and obviously in the way that it's written it's very kind of a stream of consciousness in places where you feel like there's from a reader's point of view you feel like there's been zero filter on this this is mm. like coming out as fast as it's coming out the brain kind of thing yeah where do you sit on holding back and and are you happy just to open yourself up completely or where's the where's the line on that well yeah it's interesting because you know at the time like i said i would i was basically i, I had a friend tell me who read it recently they said i read your book and it felt like you were writing for your wife and it in many ways was that because yeah i'd worked on the railway for about two years i'd saved up twenty five thousand dollars, which is way more money than i'd ever had in my whole life and like I said, I said at the beginning of the podcast, I decided to do this really, you know, at once romantic, but also incredibly serious pursuit where I was going to move to Spain with the intention of living there for a year and writing uh, this book. And I didn't care if I spent basically all the money. I, 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 was, I knew that all the grants and all the um, publishers and all the... Um, uh agents or anyone you know i'd been off the scene for so yeah, long yeah, and yeah. um everyone yeah. had forgot so I, I was gonna put my money where my mouth was and i was gonna better myself essentially so in terms of that period of time in my life you know any way that i could translate or try to translate what had happened from my head and make it cohesive and meaningful and readable and hopefully relatable and more than anything, you know, would make other people, uh, because I remembered how lonely it felt to be suffering in that silent way. And one of my hopes was that, you know, other people who, because chronic pain doesn't really get talked about that much. Mm -hmm. you know? It's it's really hard to understand it. And even before I yeah. suffered from it, it was something that, you know, I, I, I basically didn't think about really. So one of the other goals, one of the big goals was that I wanted other people to feel less alone, mm. to feel seen and heard. However, you know, when you then publish a book and it comes out and someone <laughs> writes a review and it's like one star, <laughs> you, <laughs> you've, you've, you've basically put a lot, you know, on the line. Mm. But But you also know or you grow to know or you remind yourself that, you know, everyone is coming to this book with their own criteria and, and every, every and everything is subjective mm. and you hold on to why you wrote the book. And it, it did felt very much like I had sort of exercised something and I felt free when I completed it. And mm. there was a shift of energy that occurred. And it's not fashionable to say that, you know, writing a book is cathartic, but <laughs> for me, it was extremely cathartic. Mm. And i I don't think I would have been able to move on with my life, at least as a writer, had I not mm. been able to complete that book. Do so. Just your little point you made in there, in and amongst, what, what's your view on reviews? Are you a reader of reviews or are you an ignorer of reviews? Or Yeah, I mean, I've, I have been following the reviews on this book. It's hard not to. Yeah, and, and I, I don't mean you, yeah. from a sort of ego point of view, but when you're trying to do this life as a writer, which, you know, is already incredibly challenging and difficult, yeah. um, you know, not exclusively, but for sure when, when the book comes out, you know, these people who review, they, they, they hold a lot of power. Yeah. And mm. I mean, I used to review books. I remember when I was like 22 and I hadn't done much, but somehow I was in charge of reviewing 
uh, a work by a famous author and I'd loved her first book, but I didn't particularly enjoy the second one. And I gave it, I think, two and a half or three stars. And I look back at that time now and I honestly think that, you know, I mean, I'm all for a nuanced, uh, in, intelligent critique of a work and why yeah. the work doesn't yeah. work. Absolutely. Mm. But when 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 reviewers sort of don't engage with the literature and perhaps more engage with their own preconceived notions of what they would have. I'm not really too sure, but to, to answer your question, yes, but with increasingly a sort of, um, I don't really mind what I read. Yeah, what yeah. I'm what I'm more interested in is I just want this book to reach as many people as possible. Yeah. So you wouldn't necessarily yeah. uh, read a review and then change your next book based on the advice that you've been given. I might by, lean uh... in harder to the angle depending <laughs> on the review. Just to annoy them. No, it's <laughs> funny because I was um, uh, happened when I was uh, researching before this. Your um, earlier book, Lion Attack, mm. there's kind of on Goodreads. There's an awful lot of good reviews, might I add. But um, one of the bad reviews that stuck out. Can I just share it with you? Hope yeah, please. Right. <laughs> um, by a lady called Sophie. And and just when you were saying there, but actually, you know, if people engage with it and they're talking about how it kind of works and it just doesn't work for them, that's kind of fine. And you can read a lot into their review. And I thought this was interesting in that. So she gave it one star. And her, her review is, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the kind of thing where you can read that and think, all oh, right, yeah, cool, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. We can use, we can build on that for next yeah, that time. We good. can use that. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. So it's, uh, so it's U R G. Hang on, just let me take some notes. Yeah. <laughs> no exclamation, no exclamation mark. Interestingly. No ex- so <laughs> yeah. So a pretty strong one star. It's not like it's a half star. Yeah. That's a, that's a full star. Ugh. That is quite strong. That sounds like someone. That sounds like someone who might have been in one of your books. <laughs> That's what I reckon. Possibly. And do you, the story do you think didn't quite match. That's not what yeah. happened. Yeah. Oh. Do you think people do you think people behave differently around no, you, yeah. Oliver? Because they're they're aware that they might end up yeah, now they being know story that they could be fodder. in the next book. Yeah. You can sort of imagine people like <laughs> on the two extremes, either kind of walking on eggshells and being really polite and anodyne or the total Please. opposite, like being completely outrageous in order to ensure their place in your next book. Well, yeah, I mean, my friend Toby, who's made an appearance. Like if a podcast got mentioned. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, the John, Dave and Tom show, maybe where we can write yeah. some chapters in. Um, my friend Toby, he's in, he's in both books, um, although admittedly he's, he hasn't read either of them, but <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he reads science fiction. He doesn't like, he doesn't like, the kind of things that I write, but I show him what what part of the stories he's in, which are often, mm. um, or at least were, quite drug fueled and alcohol heavy and um, <laughs> sort of um, ridiculous. But he loves it. He he buys the books for his mum. He buys them for his dad. He sends them all home. <laughs> so, and depending yeah. how drug fueled, it's probably quite a good way for him to actually remember what's happened. Well, <laughs> isn't it, Jimmy? It's quite a good way to recap. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, that's the hell with that. Right, yeah. That makes yeah. more sense. I mean, assuming the whole memory and the fallibility and, you know, the, the autofiction. It but... sounds, uh, Oliver, like you've always written stories since you were young. Have you have you kept everything? Do you, do you have like a, um, a box full of your old stories and stuff? Yeah, I have, I have like a little box that when I went back in lockdown um, and I was living with my mum and dad and... Uh, she brought out this box of essentially what I had called short stories, volume one. <laughs> I must have been six. Um, what volume are you on now? <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, not like these though, because they were they were essentially just very abstract crayon drawings of dinosaurs <laughs> or clowns or waterfalls or volcanoes, and then it would say like the clown went to the volcano and fell. And then at the bottom, it would say, not. So, <laughs> oh, you've always been doing it. I got you. Kind of, kind of genius. Like, oh, I looked yeah, at these things yeah. and I was really impressed. I think we should send that to Sophie off Goodreads. Yeah. <laughs> like I that. think that might get her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that you, could be some of your best work. Win her back. <laughs> get Sophie back on board. It's the redemption story we all need. No, I guess I've been writing. I've been writing for a long time. Yeah, probably all my life, I suppose. But that that's probably the thing that sticks out to me the most. I think I won a competition when I was in year 
six for some story in America and then and then took maybe 12 years off I had my, <laughs> my my Bukowski off years yeah. do you remember that story that that award-winning story no it's oh. lost but there's something kind of beautiful and poetic about that, well in a way it? yeah you can make it up yeah, now, can't that's you? It. I can't I can't believe we've got to this point in our chat and we've not once mentioned the orgy <laughs> I, I mean that is extraordinary to me it is such well, i didn't want to be the one yeah. to it's such a good bit subject. of train lord because it's sort of it's such a bad bit it's, just, it's awful it's a it? bit of everything in there it's funny and yeah. it's hard to read not as in hard to read it's easy to read it's sort of you know cringy but it's also quite sweet and painful um but yeah i'm not going to ask you how much of it was true but i i do want to know really what uh i suppose what if we kind of asked this question before, but I, 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 I think I, I found it quite inspiring when I read it because I, I think in the past I've always really held back. You've always been worried about your performance at orgies, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> <that kind> of... <laughs> no, I've always held back a lot in my writing. I don't necessarily want people to know what goes on in my head. I think that's probably what it is. Was there a point at which you were just you kind of made a decision to just lay it all out there? like every everything yeah do you know what i mean or have you always written everything that's in your head no 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 i mean that that scene i guess stood out in my head because i mean it's all essentially exactly how it happened um i mean you've got to remember that this was the same day it was the first time in 10 months after i'd basically nearly off myself and then didn't and then re yeah, return yeah. to oh no it's very much in its context yeah. in the yeah. book yeah it's yeah. not a random orgy kind of chapter yeah, yeah. seven um <laughs> <laughs> i like the idea that it was put in afterwards that, that, that your agent or editor went i love the book it's all good can we i was thinking maybe that next appeal <laughs> chapter seven chapter eight maybe <laughs> just put a put an orgy in and make it fail <laughs> yeah. you know that'll then really... you write the orgy you write this beautiful pornographic lovely amazing <laughs> right no yeah. what we need make it more melancholy make it yeah, all very make melancholy it, make it make fail. the reader which is kind of yeah. almost what you want to, it almost wanted you to walk into the book get into the book and give you a little bit of a cuddle and just take you out of there yeah well and i think like i guess the interesting yeah the interesting part about well that was because i you know i wasn't in pain for the first time and i was seeing some friends i hadn't seen for a while and you know it was kind of like that thing about when i lied to you on the other story but then i tell you i've lied and so you're kind of like well what the what the hell just happened and and for me it was like i'm, I'm no longer in pain physically for the first yeah, time yeah. but my mind still reeling and racing and i'm and how the hell would i you know in hindsight yeah. i'd want to give myself a hug i was like what what were you thinking but i knew what i was thinking i was like i want to get high and i want to fuck which <laughs> seemed like a really fun thing to do at the time because i was trying to escape and yeah I, obviously i couldn't um but it is tender and it is beautiful for me anyway because you know those I don't even know if I'm allowed to say this, so you probably won't even know them, but essentially um, there's a band called Confidence Man um, and they are in the orgy. And at their um, show in Barcelona in 2019, I was it backstage with them after their gig and and they asked me to read the, like, the scene out because I told <laughs> them I'd sort of written about them. And then... Like, these are, like, cool mm. people, right? Like, they're, mm. like, rock stars. And by the end of it, we were all bawling our <laughs> eyes out. And Grace, who's It wasn't in the quite book, the effect they were imagining, probably. <laughs> Grace, who's yeah. in the book, was just yeah. hugging me and, like, saying, you know, she didn't know. And, of course, she didn't know. That was yeah, the yeah. whole point about the pain. But, again, it was really cathartic to share that story. Um, and I feel like we bonded because of it. Um, kind of even more so but what did that what did that come out of that that decision if you like to just not hold back at all in your writing was that from a, a long time ago was that kind of alt lit th that um that period when you sort of involved in that scene was it partly to um, do with that or i mean i would say like, at least for me like i i felt like this book was a pretty huge kind of departure from what might have been called alt lit well alt lit before i think was a lot more concrete i went i did this mm. i i walked here they said this i felt this a lot more two-dimensional and and for me i guess with this book and i say especially in that orgy scene you know 
to to balance the at once excitement, grotesque, beautiful infatuation of sex with the worst thing that could happen in that space, which would be failure <laughs> to be able to do that and essentially, you know, crawling to the other, army crawling to the other side of an orgy and holding your hands in your head and wondering what's <laughs> uh you know why you're sort of starting to have a panic attack um and i knew i knew it would i could feel it that it was gonna um do things to the reader like i, I kind of knew yeah because it was essentially like a 99 percent translation from me on on what had happened yeah. in the real life and it certainly broke my it's heart. very good it's a very big scene it's brilliant um let's talk deadlines yep let's talk deadlines ollie when is the next book finished no deadlines no deadlines <laughs> wow. i mean i've not signed another deal um, i only signed a one book deal and, and i know basically from my history i would never want to sign a two book deal you know like what the book that you would at one point pitch mm. you know over the course of three six twelve months there's no way at least for me mm. books tend to grow and change and mm. and that's part of the attraction but you know having said that yeah, I'm trying to write with an open mind and with curiosity and without pressure. And I'm trying to find, you know, I've always kind of said that like writing a book is like completing a jigsaw puzzle, but except you can't see the picture on the front of the box <laughs> and the pieces are constantly changing, which which is to kind of say that it's more or less the hardest thing in the world. But when, or at least in my experience, twice, when you find, I guess, what I call like the keystone. So, you know, mm. it could be the sentence or the paragraph that tonally and stylistically has the energy required to carry a text along mm. for that huge duration of time. Once you figured out that voice for me, then the writing happens very quickly, but it yeah. can take years mm. trying to find that piece. So Lord knows I've done a lot of writing. But yeah, I'm still kind of searching. I have the idea, which is good. And, and you know, and writing is essentially like learning a new language mm. each time. And the heartbreaking thing is for all those failed writers out there, of which, you know, most of the time I am one, is that writing is not linear. Like, like every other job, well, most of the non-creative jobs, you know, my sister's a doctor. So you work for a while and then you become register and you work for a little bit more and then eventually you retire really rich after a lot of <laughs> your own trauma, dealing with people and sleepless nights. But in writing, you you know, just because you write one yeah. book doesn't mean you're qualified <laughs> to write the next, right? Oh man, it's it's a real it's a real mm. doozy. But you do it because you love it. And again, as my you know, my mentor, um, Amanda Lurie says, you've just got to hold your nerve. Just hold your nerve, Oliver. Just hold your nerve. And eventually, you know, you, you will, that idea will visit you and you will enter into a partnership with it. And if you honor one, one another and give each other enough space and trust each other enough, then, yeah, you'll eventually settle into a new flow, which is what I'm trying to find out. Well, there we go. The ro the romantic version of Muse <laughs> writing, isn't it? Waiting for the Muse to hit. Well, Ollie, thank you so much for um, spending your time with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, and good luck with your continuing writing endeavours and your attempt to live in all the capital cities of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the true topic of this podcast, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. John, Dave, and Tom, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I hope you have. Don't thank room. Dave. He couldn't be bothered turning up. Don't. don't no, well, Dave's not even <laughs> here. No. Oh, Never well, made it. Edit that out. Uh, <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you so much. Yeah, really thanks, Oliver. It. It's been great. Cheers. Oh, I I forgot something. I, you I don't you haven't. Um, I'm guessing you haven't uh, listened to much of the podcast, but we quite often when we have a guest, we'll write them a little song. Oh, and I um I tossed off a little ditty. Oh, today let's, let's have just a for you. Oh. It was it's quite heartfelt, but it goes. <laughs> Do you know yeah. how how pathetic it is, John, to go right? See you later, then, guest. Thanks for coming. Oh no, come back, come back. <laughs> Listen to my song. <laughs> no, I don't. I totally forgot I was going to play it before. Yeah, we don't usually play them to the guest. Oh, actually, do we? Got an hour. I just thought, why not? Yeah. Why yeah, not? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a privilege. I told you about the orgy. The least you could do is <laughs> play the song. The migraine's so pernicious. It's like the pain of existence. 
There's a palpable friction between truth and fiction. I'm craving oblivion, better than the hell I'm living in. I could be there in time for tea. I just finished this orgy. That was. Palpable. One of your deeper sentimental ones. Actually. It really is. I love it's a, it's a that. powerful little number, but I love I that. Nice. I, I even got the orgy <laughs> reference in it. I was pleased. Yeah, but there was, no, there was no cheap jokes or anything. It was that was quite deep, <laughs> no. wasn't it? You took a risk. Yeah, and it paid off. Paid yeah, off. I think so. I think, it did. I think it so. Paid off big time. I appreciate <laughs> that. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, you're welcome. Thanks a lot, mate. Right. Yeah, Ollie, you are actually allowed to leave this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Off you go. Quick, before he thinks of something. Right. See you guys. Thanks so much. Cheers, buddy. Thanks a lot, mate. You know what? Look, no, 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 no. Go on, then. You go. No, you go. You know what? I forgot to ask Ollie, mm-hmm. uh, which I regret, is whether the migraines have actually stopped altogether. Yeah. He kind of gave the, he gave the impression that they weren't a problem yes. anymore, didn't he? But yeah. But whether they were still yeah. occasional or there was... Yeah, just lurk in the background. Sword of Damocles. Mm. Anyway, what an interesting life the man has led yeah, already. Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of... What, what, what's your um, thinking on autofiction, Tom? Are you kind of... Do you feel like it's, you know, it's fair game? Are you right behind it? Or do you feel like, as a writer, writing about your own experiences, it's, it's almost like you've got a contract with the reader? Do you know what I mean? To, to tell the truth. No, because I think... Nobody truly tells the truth anyway, do they? The mm, old, everyone tells their own version of their story mm. and embellishes it in places or plays down parts that maybe they're not so proud of. Or, yeah, yeah. So I think it's it's more of a magnification of that, isn't it, rather than a, a black and white yeah. thing. So I think it's something that everyone does in conversation or, you know, if you're meeting someone mm. at parties and stuff, there's, there's an element yeah. of that in, in what have you. So I guess stuff like this is maybe just stretching the envelope a little bit further mm. for the sake of entertainment. You get the feeling as well that Ollie's, Ollie's an incredibly honest person. So he's not actually, he's not setting out to deliberately deceive you. No. If anything, the opposite, really. He's trying to give the impression of his experiences as truthfully as he can, you know, think of the way of doing that, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'd say I think that's almost the thing, isn't it, with him? That he's, it's not that he's lying about a situation, but he might change how that situation is reported yeah, in order, in order to... to properly reflect the emotions and sequence of events yeah, that yeah. ended up happening. Yeah, that's for right. White lies, little white lies. Yeah, there you go. They just kind of oil the wheels. But it's good. Get yourself a copy. Yeah. It's really fascinating, quite different. Train Lord. It's also, cool. did you clock the fact that Ollie was at the Edinburgh Fringe? No. He's, he was doing a version of Train Lord as a performance Ooh, piece. Good Lord. Yeah, I know. Good Lord. Train Lord. Good Lord. Yeah. I think that's the strap line. I hope he didn't do the disappointing orgy bit on stage. Well, I think he might have mentioned it, yeah. Right. He, mm. I think it's in the show, in, like in the show notes. So I think he does. Oh. I mean, you'd be disappointed if he didn't, wouldn't you? Yeah. but yeah. I can see that working, weirdly, as a, as a performance piece. Anyway, look out for him. He might be, uh, he might still be doing it. I'm not sure. He could be doing anything, John. It's bloody ages since we talked to him. Well, no, exactly. He was living in, where was he living in Georgia or something? Or I can't remember, John. It was ages I ago. I can't remember either. <laughs> anyway. Oliver, if you remember doing the interview with us, thank you very much. We appreciate it. God, I mean, aren't people lucky us giving people this, you know, bonus stuff? Yeah. I just feel, you know, free, free as well, Tom. I know, I know, we're fools, fools There's to no, ourselves. We're not hiding we? behind any Patreon yeah. or anything. Don't say that. Don't, don't say that. We might do that in the future. <laughs> that's true. Dead. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Yeah. So, what's up next, Tom? Uh, because obviously, uh, you really are very lucky people because we've got another episode coming up next week. Due yeah, to the fact me. that this is a, a little sneaky in betweener. What's next? What is next? Yeah. Are you, oh, you're, you're sending it back to me. What's next? I'm definitely not stalling to next? try and look on our sheet of what's nextness. I've just remembered. I've just remembered it's a good one. What is it? It's National Poetry Day next week. Shut the front door. No, it's not. It is. So it's our Simon Armitage poetry special. Oh, it's one of the best episodes we've ever made, John. It's an absolute belter. It's it really a little is. bit. <laughs> it's a little bit feature length. Yeah. <laughs> it came out quite long. There's so much but, stuff um, in it that's brilliant. Oh, these people are so lucky, John. <laughs> yeah. I actually really love this episode. It is a bit different. And, yeah, uh, it is. It quite is. Quite fun. Yeah, it's National Poetry Day next week. 
and we are celebrating. You probably remember that we uh, we asked for people to send their poems in. Yeah. So there will be poems featured from our listeners, and it's just a good day out, isn't it, Tom? We did have a lovely day out, a lovely day out. We literally go out into the wilds hunting poetry. That's it, with our spears of verse. Something to look forward to. But before we go... I would just like to do one other little bit of business Mm -hmm. unrelated to our competition, but as part of our writers outreach program, giving back to the world of writers, can we give a little shout out to In Another Time magazine? No, definitely not. Don't shout out. No, can't do that? Okay. What's it about? It's a sci-fi, fantasy and horror genre zine who are currently asking for writers of those genres who would like feedback on their work to get involved in their community feedback project. I thought this was quite a nice idea. So oh, if you want to get nice. involved... Yeah, yeah, do mention it. Yeah, okay, let's let's do it. If you think you'd benefit from uh, some more eyes on your writing and you'd like to help other writers by feeding back on their work too in those genres, send 500 words of anything you've written in those genres. It could be the opening 500 words of a novel, flash fiction, poems, short story, whatever, to... In another time magazine at gmail.com and get involved. But all the details can be found in their Twitter feed, their X feed, whatever. So it's a bit like um, what we were doing, isn't it, with the send as your first three chapters? Uh, very similar. Yeah, very similar. Except you might get some decent feedback <laughs> from these people because you get it from like a mix of people rather than us. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, yeah, great idea. Yeah, oh, no, it's, it's always quite yeah. nice. Be brave, people. Get that feedback. Yeah, so that uh, the their Twitter feed is at in another time M. Uh, but you need to get a shift on because you've only got until the end of September. So send it Well, over. people love it. People love a deadline. So enter our competition first because that's the first deadline. Yeah, get that out of the way because you might win £500. Yeah. Pounds. This doesn't win you any money. No, but so. it gets you some good feedback, uh, hopefully. Yeah, there you go. Outreach done. A little bit done for the writing community. It's what we're all about, really, isn't it, John? It is. It's all about giving back, Tom. All about giving back. It is. Right. Well, we'll, we'll see you all next time. You probably, for the next episode, like I said, we are going out and about, so maybe some comfortable socks and sensible footwear is probably what yeah, we recommend. Yeah, perfect. Don't forget a coat. Yeah, I don't know if you, the you might not need quickly. it. Yeah, just a thin coat, probably. Yeah, yeah. it'll be all right. So we'll uh, see you then. Thanks for listening. Hello. Hello. Where's everybody gone? Hey, Ollie, how you doing? Yeah, good, mate. How are you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Very good. I'm just. I uh, just wanted to say thanks so much for having me uh, on on your pod- podcast, guys. So, oh, you're yeah. very welcome. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Oh, we'll have uh, anyone of us. We're not. <laughs> <first mate. laughs> well, we're not brilliant. a big hero. We're just. You know what I mean? We just <laughs> take what we can get. That's nah, good. I was.